So Andre Yot is a turn of the century modernist. He, I think, is known as a cubist, and if you look at his work, he's sort of like a Art Deco plus cubism effect in it. Um, he is also very much known as a teacher. He taught until the end of his life in the 1960s and had one of the very first modernist schools open after World War I in Paris. I know about Andre Yot uh, not because of his work, but because of his writing. A, a couple of the books he wrote, and he wrote, he wrote many, many books, and a couple of them were uh, have been translated into English, and I found them very provoking. And at one point in one of his books, he compares a painting by Cezanne to a painting by a Dutch master. So, and he notes that in the Dutch painting and Dutch Dutch paintings in general from that time. The sky is very large. It takes up a lot of uh, attention in the painting. Then you have a tree or a group of trees and then a very large uh, formation of clouds that sort of fill that space. And then he notes in the, in the painting by Cezanne that in his paintings in general, certainly not all of his landscape painting, uh, he doesn't use the sky to fill up as much space. It actually usually takes up about a tenth, he said, of the, of the, uh, of the painting. The rest of it um, is with form. And so how do you fill a landscape painting with form? Well, you compose vertically. So you have, you know, the foreground and then is in front and then the middle ground is just placed on top, almost like a building, second floor, and then third floor is the background as you can see in this painting. Um, in, in these types of paintings, there's, there's a third dimension, but it's sort of suggested. It's not an imitation via linear perspective, or the, there is linear perspective, but it's local, it's local linear perspective. It's just for an individual form rather than the whole painting. And this comparison came to mind, especially the analysis of the Cezanne painting, um, since I was in Venice this week just for a, a few days uh, and spent a lot of time looking at Tintoretto. It's Tintoretto's 500th birthday, big event for the city, since he's arguably the most visible of painters there. So I can't possibly say I understand completely what's going on in Tintoretto's compositions, but I do see a, a similar strategy similar tactic of constructing the paintings vertically where you have instead of forms falling back into space they're simply placed on top of each other and it occurred to me while looking at these paintings in in c2 you know you have the, the they're framed architecturally and that the space made by the frames by the ornaments and you have, you know, there's an element closest to us and folds back into the painting is roughly the same amount of space that is inside the painting itself. I'm not saying that there's not depth or diminution of figures or any sort of linear perspective at all in the painting. There is. I, I, I just feel that the depth itself is um, achieved by overlaps and the hierarchy of values, which I've spoken about a bit in, in other videos. It's very ambiguous, the relationship that figures even have with each other. I mean, they're all uh, sort of pushed up close to each other. Even in, you can see in the Assumption of the Virgin here, you have a strict architectural element inside the painting, but yet still where figure's stand isn't very clear, and I, I don't think he lets it become clear, because if he were to do that, the space would have too much three-dimensionality in it, and that would destroy the cohesiveness of the relationship between the framing, the architectural framing around the painting, and uh, the painting itself. So these paintings here are, are from San Rocco. The first uh, little 
segment I showed was a, a, from the Ducal Palace. That was the main hall, which I, I, think they, I believe they said is one of the biggest rooms in Europe. All these paintings of his, even though some of them are in better condition than others, I mean, they're, they're just transcendent masterpieces. And so you can even see how, from this view, the paintings need to fit in the architecture, but also they just need to fit into the wall. The fact that the, what they're sitting into is two-dimensional as well. Let's quickly look at this Tiepolo. It's, I don't know, I, again, I can't remember where they took it out of, but it's, it's gigantic and uh, it's, it's a little bit difficult to see from this front view, but it's tipped forward. So the thing feels like it's about to fall on you. Uh, and he, of course, also composes form with a concern to the surface. You can see uh, this uh, Archangel Michael, St. Michael, you know, the relationship he's, his drapery is kind of right at the surface of the painting, yet he himself is sort of above the cross. All the, all the space is very ambiguous. But again, it's, anyway, to go back to the Cezanne, it's, it's vertically on the surface composed rather than into depth. It's very clear in this little study.